Um, the joke will be, the joke's already old, um, but we were laughing, and a few of you in this room have already made comments about how uh, Pastor Dave assigned me the week that we're going to be talking about the sloth and the sluggard. <laughs> Let that brew for a little bit. Uh, I want to thank Pastor Dave and, uh, and, and Ken for giving me the opportunity to speak this morning and to share. I have to thank him for his research as well that he gave me. He essentially just gave me his sermon and said, here, preach. <laughs> um, so I'm not reading his words. I did do my own time of study and, and, and research and looked at everything. Uh, but I have to thank him for giving, us, giving me that. I also want, off by starting, I want to start off by sharing with you that we have a new volunteer team here at Salvo Christian Fellowship. And the volunteer team that we're calling it is the Sluggard Waker. The Sluggard Waker is based off of an old 18th century British tradition in the churches, and we thought it would be a good idea, uh, so we thought we'd try and experiment here. Uh, Sluggard Waker's in the room. My nephew just played in the OBAs this weekend, and he's falling asleep, so just keep an eye on him while he's trying to stay awake. The sole job of the Sluggard Waker was to literally keep an eye on the congregation and uh, tap on them if they were starting to fall asleep and nod off. The actual tapping was not done by hands, but rather with long wooden sticks that were found in the local forests. This is true. You can look it up on Wikipedia. Wikipedia doesn't ever lie, does it? <laughs> the long wooden sticks were tapped or tipped with either brass knobs or brass forks uh, or foxtails. And the gentleman in the room, you would be getting uh, tapped with brass knobs or forks on the top of the head. Uh, and it wasn't gently either or subtly. It was quite... Uh, vicious. And ladies, you'd be uh, tapped with the foxtails. And so, Saul, I'll keep your eye out for the sluggard waker in the room. You won't know who they are. <laughs> Phil Reed is not standing by the door for any reason in particular. <laughs> but can you imagine, can you imagine being that person trying to stay awake and probably focusing more on the person near you with a long wooden stick rather than the word being spoken? Or can you perhaps imagine being the person whacking people across the head? Who's going to sign up for that? <laughs> Phil Reed. There we go. <laughs> this morning we're wrapping up a series, as Ken said, called, the, uh, called Freedom from the Seven Deadly Sins. And the bottom line here that I want to, that we want to as the pastoral staff is we want to share God's word, not our own. And so as we prepare, will you join me as we pray once again for the message? God, thank you for another day. Thank you for a day to experience your love and your grace and your freedom. Thank you that we do not find condemnation, but rather freedom in your presence. This morning, may we tune into your voice. May we be alert and conscious of your spirit as we hear from you. In Jesus' name, amen. So allow me again to share very quickly, uh, before we even dive into the scripture and the points and everything else. As you're listening to this, as you're taking notes, as you're, as you're taking it all in, if you start to feel convicted, if you start to hear, have the thoughts Andy's talking about me, or how dare you, Andy, say this or this or this. Please, from the bottom of my heart, know that I'm not talking to any of you, any of you in particular. This message was written with no one in mind. This message, uh, it wasn't a moment where I was sitting there thinking, well, Phil, read this, and Ken Holly that, and I'll just pick on them cause, just because I can. The only person that I was thinking about while I was preparing this message was me. And the joke was made, well, Andy was given the week of the sloth for a reason, and I don't think that's the case. But as I went through this message, and as I've been listening and, and paying attention to this entire series, there's been a bit of conviction going on in my life. And if I'm the only one, awesome. <laughs> and if I'm not the only one, then be encouraged that you're not alone. This was one of the hardest messages that I've prepared so far. And if you saw my Facebook post, and then you saw how I was struggling with it and everything else, because there were moments where this message was very convicting. This whole series has been a slap uh, on the head, not a sluggard wagger slap, but more of a kind of smarten up kid kind of slap in the head. This message was written in a week where all I wanted to do was rest and sleep and maybe possibly be lazy because I thought I had deserved it. I worked hard last weekend. There's a lot going on. I just needed a week just to... Any of us have those kind of weeks or months or years? <laughs> I thought I deserved it. I thought I had earned it. And if you're here or if you listen to online the week that we talked on gluttony, maybe that sounds a little familiar. I deserve a time of rest. 
And so again, if you feel convicted, perhaps, rather than feeling convicted and getting mad or angry, feel encouraged that you're not alone, that someone else in the room has felt convicted about this message. With that being said, if you're taking notes, make a tick on your paper as we go through a list or or keep track on your hands just to see kind of where you land. But have you ever said or have you ever thought these words that I'm going to read? Someday I'll be out of this mess. Someday I'll make enough money. Fill in the blank. Someday the right person will just randomly find me through LinkedIn or something and offer me the perfect job where I can sleep for a week at a time. Someday the bank will call and all my debt will disappear. Someday the right girl or the right guy will just find me and propose to me on the spot. Teenagers, that doesn't happen. Someday my children will behave 125% of the time. And all the parents just laughed. Someday I will never lose my temper or patience. Someday my metabolism will speed up again and I'll lose weight. Someday I'll check off those tasks on my to-do list. Or let's bring it more closer to home. Let's look at, look at the word tomorrow. Tomorrow I'll clean the house. Tomorrow I'll do the laundry. Tomorrow I'll fill out the paperwork that I've been putting off for a week at a time. Tomorrow I'll send that check. Tomorrow I'll get gas in the car. Or tomorrow I'll fill in the blank. In the research shared with me, I learned that Ambrose University called this whole tomorrow I'll do this or someday I'll do that is called the someday drift. What happens when we drift? When we drift in life, we drift downward. We do not drift upward. We drift towards slavery, towards whatever habits you're building. We don't drift towards freedom. So let's think about it in the real world. When, you, when you're sitting in Sable River or Sogging River or Lazy River or just any sort of body of water, and you're drifting, and you're not putting any effort into it, you're going wherever the water takes you. And it's the same thing in life. It takes work, it takes persistence, it takes dedication to go upstream, to go against the flow. But if you sit back and you relax and you let the river take you wherever you go, wherever it wants to go, you go downstream, And most often than not, you'll go in a dangerous place. If we were to take the rivers into the lake and the lake to St. Clair River, to Lake Erie, to Lake Ontario, you'll end up in the ocean at some point in the journey. So we've been studying the different areas in our life that we need to be made aware of. And today we're landing in the book of Proverbs. If you're taking notes, we're, we're landing all over the book of Proverbs. And the book of Proverbs calls... These someday people, or tomorrow I will people, Proverbs calls them sluggards, or sloths, or lazy people. And so these seven deadly sins, which you can listen to on past sermons and podcasts and find them online if you missed any, they are recognized as the following. The list is on the screen. Lust and anger and pride and envy and gluttony and greed. And the week of Andy, sloth. No, I'm kidding. (laughs) But these aren't the worst sins. As we learned earlier on, they were recognized as evil dispositions which motivate us to sin. They are labeled as destructive behavior and attitudes that will ultimately lead us to hell's destruction. And in the kingdom of heaven, if we call ourselves Christ followers, there's no room for those whose lifestyles is characterized by any of these seven deadly sins. And so as I've learned to do with my preaching from my first day here, I point the finger at myself as much as I try to inspire you and encourage you and teach you and and maybe push you a little bit. I point the finger at myself and ask a question. When I hear the word sluggard, what do I think of? I think of lazy. So am I lazy? If I am, and after reading what I've read and learned, I'm a little worried if I do fall into that category of lazy. How could this be? How could I be lazy? I work my backside off. I work hard. I, I, I deserve a rest every once in a while. I'm not lazy. How many of us ever think those words? Before we jump into this, do not be fooled. A sluggard isn't just a lazy person, although it could be. Laziness is often a symptom or the outward appearance of the attitude of the heart. A sluggard could be the busiest person in the room. It doesn't necessarily mean that we're doing nothing. Slothfulness is not, or sluggardness is not laziness. Slothfulness is fulfilling the want to rather than the have to. 
I want to sit on my couch all afternoon today and do nothing. I have to do some other things. To be guilty of the sin of the lifestyle of a sloth means that you have failed to do what needs to be done when it needs to be done. Have we ever had a task that we didn't look forward to and so we would do anything else? Have we ever reorganized anything else so that you wouldn't have to organize what you had to organize? Have you ever cleaned something else so that you didn't have to focus on what you had to clean? Have you ever read a book or wrote something just so you didn't have to focus on what you knew you had to do, just so you could distract yourself from doing the responsibility that you had to do? Have you ever taken a nap because it would make you more productive afterwards? Because you don't have any, as much time in the day, so you have to be more productive. I'll admit there were moments that I found myself being very convicted by this because I pride myself in being busy sometimes. Anyone else wear that badge, the pride badge? I'm so busy, I don't have time for whatever. Yes, this person is lazy, but if you read through Proverbs, Solomon describes this person as much more than just lazy. They are a self-seeker. They are a pleasure seeker. They are short-sighted. They, are, they lack self-discipline. They are a procrastinator. They rationalize. They very often take the path of least resistance. They only do what they have to do. They use any excuse they can to get out of work. They require constant supervision and prodding. They have many desires and plans, but they don't do the work to attain them. They're often conceited and refuse to face reality of what they are. They are foolish or they're wicked, they're vain, they're afraid. And so as I read this, I, I think, this, I, I'm not that way. That can't be me. What I want to do today is look at three areas of our lives that we could be found as sluggers and offer ways of freedom. If we are Christ followers, we should want to find freedom from these sins in our lives. A, just for our own freedom. Who wants to walk around in life carrying baggage and chains and guilt and shame and everything else? But also, we should want to find freedom to share the hope and freedom and joy that others could have through Jesus. We should share that. Because if we're not free, how do we then share the freedom that we should have experienced to others? Here's how, where my brain went. I could try and sell someone a lemon meringue pie. Why did you mention lemon meringue pie? Because last time I mentioned food, I mentioned Doritos, and three bags magically appeared at my door. So I figured I'd go, I'd go bigger. <laughs> I could try and sell someone what I believe, believe to be the best steak. Yes, I raise the ante. The best steak in the world. Because that's what I've been told. But if I've never experienced it, if I'm only telling people what I've heard, there's no authenticity in my words. And so the truth of the freedom of Christ is revealed and made obvious. It's made visible when we have experienced it, and then we're able to share it. And so why not learn how we can be free from these seven deadly sins, and so that we can help our friends and our neighbors and our family find that same freedom. We're not to hoard it. We are to make it known, and we are to, we are to make him known. So let's find some freedom. The first area that we want to look at is our work. Are you a sluggard at your place of employment? And if we are a sluggard, are we being a clear representation of who Jesus is? Probably not. I, absolutely not. There was a story that Pastor Dave shared with me that went like this. For 11 months, a young lady served her prison sentence. While incarcerated, a grandmother cared for her four-year-old daughter. <clears throat> this gal counted the days until she could be reunited with her precious little girl. Three weeks after she was released, she was told the father of the child wanted full custody. It seemed odd that she was, he was unwilling to care for his child before or while the mother was in prison. And now he has a sudden desire to be the sole caretaker. However, the rest of the story soon came out. He had discovered that if he got custody, he could apply to receive free housing and a monthly check. He can almost totally remove himself from having to work. That is a sluggard. Maybe that's a bit extreme. But is this next scenario maybe more familiar? I reset my watch, I adjusted my chair, I loosened my tie and straightened my hair. I filled my pen and tested the blotter and gone for another drink of water. I adjusted the calendar and raised the blind and I sorted erasers of all different kinds. And now down to work, I can finally sit. Oops, too late, it's time to quit. I'll take that response as maybe we can relate to that a little bit. Have you ever had days like that? Have you ever had days at home or at school or at work where I just have to do anything but I, what I know I have to do? 
We all know these people at our work. We can all think of people in our minds of our classmates or our workmates or, or just people in the community that are maybe like that. The one that came to my mind was I spent a number of years doing landscaping back home in Windsor before I came here. It was tough work. It was, it was, it was, uh, it, oh, I hated it. <laughs> it was backbreaking, literally. Um, there is a lot of digging holes and digging trenches, and we had machinery, sure, but there was a lot of wheelbarrowing and, and beach stoning and mulching and just landscaping in general. You know what it is. But there's this one guy. I won't say his name. Uh, there's this one guy who would find any excuse not to work. He was the first one to volunteer to make a coffee run. He was the first one to run back to the, to the yard and grab more material. He was the first one to clean, make sure the trailer, our work trailer, was spotless. He'd clean it three times a day just to make sure that he didn't have to dig a trench. He would do anything possible not to do the work that needed to be done. And those things were good and they needed to be done, but not at the moment. Proverbs 6 uh, we read in Proverbs 6, verse 6, it says, take, take a lesson from the ants, you lazy bones. Learn from their ways and become wise. Though they have no prince or governor or ruler to make them work, they labor hard all summer, gathering food for the winter. But you lazy bones, how long will you sleep? How will you wake up? When will you wake up? A little extra sleep, a little more slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest. Then poverty will pounce on you like a bandit. We, la- we learn three things from this short passage in Proverbs about ants. The ant works without oversight. No one is telling them what to do. They just do. The ant works while there's opportunity. I'm at the age I'm old enough to to have been told that growing up that I needed to make hay while the sun shines. And if you're not young enough to know what it means, it basically means while you have the chance, get things done before it's too late. The ants work to do their part without regard of what others might be doing. They don't stand there and sit back and say, well, I'll keep on picking on the two guys. Well, Ken did this and Phil did that, so I'm just, I'm not going to, and I did way much more, or I didn't do enough. They don't do a checklist, they just do for the sake of themselves, for the sake of community. They work together as one. The ant works to provide for today, but they also have a plan for tomorrow. They don't do what they need to do and then stop. They make plans, they strategize, they prepare for tomorrow. What happens if it rains tomorrow and they can't collect what they need to collect? So they collect more, they collect as much as they can in case of something bad happening. Disney's movie, A Bug's Life, is an adaptation of Aesop's fable, The Ant and the Grasshopper. The the fable provides a moral lesson about hard work and preparation. Really, uh, this is like, don't quote, well, I shouldn't say don't quote me because I'm speaking into a microphone, but um, Proverbs 6, in my opinion, Proverbs 6, 6 to 8, is really a bug's, Disney's a bug's life. Story of the ant and the grasshopper. For, so for the rest of the sermon, we're just going to watch a bug's life, and then we'll, can you imagine? Popcorn will be passed around. No. I think this is important to keep in the back of our minds, though about the ant and the grasshopper. At work, at your place of employment, no matter how old you are, are you an ant? Are you working hard? Are you preparing for the so-called winter? Are you keeping your head down? Are you pushing forward with what needs to get done? Or are we the grasshopper coming and taking what we didn't work for and taking credit for what we didn't do? The landscaping job, the worker we had, he was a great guy. He was funny. He was hilarious. He was uh, uh, good to be around, but he was really, at the end of the day, useless. He was a hindrance. He was more of a pain than a help. He was a liability. We read a great description when it comes to employers and employees in Proverbs chapter 10, verse 26. Lazy people irritate their employers (laughs) like vinegar to the teeth or smoke in the eyes. I'll be honest, I didn't understand the whole vinegar to the teeth thing. I like vinegar, fries and fish and chips and all that stuff. Every time we talk, I talk about food. I don't know what it is. But we can all relate to sitting around a campfire or even a barbecue and getting that smoke in your eyes. A, fr- a, friend, of mine paste- a friend of mine pasted. A friend of mine posted on Facebook uh, about how her dad, whenever she barbecue or he barbecues, he wears these swim goggles just so he doesn't get smoke in the eyes. We can all relate to the stinging of the eyes with smoke. But here's the bottom line. Here's the, here's the point to all this. The question we need to ask is: Is this me? Are we the ant or are we the grasshopper? Are we doing our part in our place of employment? 
or are we sitting back and letting others do what needs to be done? The sluggard is a sluggard is a burden to others. A sluggard is a taker, not a giver. They are a liability. I found one other example, Proverbs 19, verse 24. Lazy people take food in their hand, but don't even lift it to their mouth. Are we a sluggard? Maybe not literally with food, but are we a sluggard like that? We don't have, even have the energy to, to take the food into our mouth. We have to have someone else do it for us. The second area that we want to look at is our home. A failure to love is often because of laziness. The Bible doesn't suggest for us to love. It commands us to love. We read that in Matthew chapter 22. In Ephesians, we read about how the husbands are commanded to love their wives, and wives are commanded to love their husbands, how all people are commanded to love their neighbors. Jesus spoke of love as something that we should do. Love isn't a feeling. It's not something we fall in and out of. Love is a verb. Any other DC Talk fans from back in the day? Love is a verb. I got one nod. Thank you, Matt Wilson. I appreciate that. Felt like I was stranded up here. (laughs) Love isn't something that just happens. It's not an accident. It's not a spontaneous emotion. Sure, a relationship may happen to fall in your lap, but love doesn't just fall in your lap. Love is something that you deliberately do. It's a decision you make, and it takes work. And nowhere is this more evident than in marriage. Are we too lazy to love each other? Do we find ourselves in a rut just going day by day and not showing and not expressing and not making sacrifices so that our spouses know that we love them? Ironically, and this isn't, I don't, I'm not looking for, ironically, this is our first year anniversary. Happy anniversary. I didn't forget. Because my sister reminded me last night. (laughs) You don't want to talk about being convicted as you're preparing a sermon. Are we making sacrifices so that our spouses know we love them? Many of us, I'm sure, I'm sure, are familiar with the five love languages. It's five, right? The book and the teaching and all that stuff. Do we know the love language of our spouse? And are we meeting them where they need to be met? What happens today is that people become lazy. People don't work hard. They're not willing to work hard to create love. They don't work hard to build or grow in their marital relationships. And so we've looked at husband and wife, and now let's let's look at parents and kids. Many problems relating to raising children today is because of the attitude of a sluggard or a sloth, or they don't care, or they're lazy. Children may become undisciplined because parents are too lazy to do the hard work associated with nurturing and training and teaching and discipline. And so I'll use my own life, so I'm not pointing fingers at anyone else, but here's some maybe examples that we can learn from this. We've been teaching our little guy to pick up after himself. Um, we, we, were trying to teaching, we were trying to teach him that things belong in certain places and all the OCD people in the room said amen. Um, and I'm not OCD, I'm particular, I'm not OCD. Uh, no, for real, I'm not, I'm not, I'm, I'm not OCD. I like a clean room. My bedroom is a mess, but... But we're trying to teach him that things belong in certain places and so we're teaching him a routine that you come home, you take your shoes off, you put your shoes away, you empty your backpack, you empty your lunchbox, you put your little backpack where it belongs for the next day, you get your clothes ready for the next day, yada, yada. We all know the routine that we try and teach our kids. And I can understand that the first few times there would be some confusion and some complaining because there's a lot of steps that an eight-year-old, nine-year-old now has to learn. But after five days of being the broken record, you'd think he'd understand. Once again, I called my dad. Dad, I'm so sorry that you were a broken record. <laughs> and that's his response. He just laughs. But here's the thing. I could, I could be aggravated and annoyed and frustrated and bang my head up against the wall trying to teach him that there's a routine that we have to do, we have to do, we have to do. Or I could take the easy way out and just do it myself. YouTube and Netflix, amazing babysitters or distractors or whatever you want to call them. And we're not yet in the, in the world of having to download music uh, and, and stuff like that. But we, at this stage of our family, we are constantly asking him, what are you watching? He's on YouTube. Or he's on Netflix. What are you watching? And I'm trying to teach him, don't just say the title, because that means nothing to me. Explain to me, describe to me, what, what are you watching? What is this about? 
I could just not care. He's on YouTube, it's safe, there's things in place, there's filters, blah, blah, blah. No, we put the work in and we ask him, what are you watching? What are you listening to? We do, I do that because lately there's this one song that he, there's a lot of songs that he sings, but there's this one song that he heard somewhere probably on YouTube or probably from a friend at school or something. And if I, if I say the first three words, it will be stuck in your head, so I won't burden you with that. But there's this one song that he started to sing, and it's catchy, I'll admit, but I was curious about the rest of the song, because he was just singing the first like five songs, or five words. So I looked up the lyrics, and we started, and I, so I pull up my phone, I'm reading the lyrics, and I go to Naughty, I'm just like, you need to read these. Let's just say he's not singing the song anymore. Are we putting the work into putting up boundaries and safeguards for our family? Are we willing to put in the work and the research and then follow up with those boundaries in order to help our children learn to keep their minds and their hearts safe? With movies and TVs, TV shows, are we willing to look around and research and read uh, reviews and watch the show before our little ones do that? And when I say little ones, I mean anybody <laughs> in this room. From 9 to 19 and anywhere else, are we doing what we need to do as parents to keep them safe? And yes, we will admit, I will admit that the pendulum can swing both ways. It can swing from being very, very strict to being very, very loose. And there's a happy medium in there somewhere. I'm not telling you how to parent. I am saying that as parents to our children, we cannot be a sluggard when it comes to raising them. We cannot say tomorrow I'll deal with it. We cannot say tomorrow I'll have a conversation with them about fill in the blank. We must face it head on. And allow me to encourage you, parents. What you see standing before you is someone who grew up in a very, uh, I'll say strict, that's fair to say, my sister's in the room, a very strict household. But what you see before you is the, the, the result of parents that uh, trained up a child in the way they, that they should go. And yes, I'm not perfect, I have made mistakes. But when your kids see you putting in the work and looking up Whatever it is that they're looking at, when your kids see the example that you're setting, they will take that with them. In most cases today, the problem with youth isn't that the parents are asking too much. It's more, more likely that the parents are asking too little because there is some slothfulness in the parents. Maybe you know of a parent that says, I won't make a big deal with kids about God. I want them to make up their own mind. I want them to discover on their own. Let me ask the question, is that in line with God's character? I think God would have us raise our children to completely know the truth of God and his sovereignty and power and to have them grow up assuming God is central to everything. And so why wouldn't we do it? Our little guy, for all his life that I know of, he's been praying at night, which is awesome. And it's the same prayer over and over and over again. And so we're stretching and we're... Uh, not physically, although sometimes I do want to. We're stretching him, we're challenging him, we're encouraging him to, to, to pray and learn how to pray. And not just say words that were told to you, but discover on your own, even as a nine-year-old, how to pray and why we pray. Why wouldn't we, as Christian parents, want our children to completely know the truth of who God is? If it's because we're tired of doing it over and over and over again, if it's because we're discouraged, because maybe they just don't listen, well, not maybe, they just don't listen, please be encouraged to not give up. Kids, you are not getting off free on this one. I'm trying to find you in the crowd. I see some of you. This isn't just a parent issue. This slothfulness, being a sluggard in the home, is just not a parent issue. Kids, students, children, little ones, everybody, <laughs> you live in the house with your parents. You live under the same roof. And so pull your weight. Do what needs to be done. Do you have chores? And if so, are you doing them? And if you are doing them, are you doing them to the best of your ability? If you don't have chores, if you're not pulling your weight, if you're not helping out around the house, Maybe surprise your parents and just do something on the blue and see what happens. Have 911 ready. They may call, they may have a heart attack. You may have to call an ambulance. But pull your weight around the house. 
Oh, I sound like a parent now. Good grief. Growing up, my parents made us do chores. It was, it was phenomenal, sarcastically. It was terrible. I hated it. We had to vacuum the house. Uh, and my mom was, was, um, she was, she should have been a detective. I could not, I used to just like not even turn the vacuum on, just move, make, make lines in the carpet. <laughs> she knew better. It was amazing. I don't know how she did it. We had an old wood, uh, wood hardwood floor, like original 100-year-old hardwood floor that we'd have to get on our hands and knees and, and put wax on the floor and then get an old three-buffered machine thing and, and buff the wood floor. And if you didn't do it well enough to their expectation, they would wake you up at 10.30 at night on a school night and go out and do it all over again. Oh. Dusting. We had to dust the house and dust different rooms. And my sister and I swore that mom would walk around with a white glove and make sure that we got all the dust off. And I, I think she did, probably. Cleaning the bathrooms, taking the garbage out, cutting the lawn, picking up after the dog. There was no, there was none of the whole, I'll do it tomorrow. No, mom had a calendar, she was organized, you do it today or you don't do it, like, you'll do it tonight, you'll do it before midnight kind of idea. And mom loved Colossians 3.23. If you're not familiar with it, allow me to read it for you. I should have it memorized because mom loved it so much. She still does love it. Work willingly at whatever you do as though you're working for the Lord rather than for people. Now, she may have taken that out of context, <laughs> but she loved to put that in her face. When you're vacuuming the house, when you're cleaning the toilet, do it as unto the Lord. Oh, okay. Mom and Dad loved the verse in Matthew where Jesus tells us to go the extra mile. Again, possibly taken out of context when we're talking about cleaning the house, but kids... When your parents ask you to do something, go the extra mile. We're, we're teaching Aiden right now to always ask the question, what else can I do? Aiden, can you set the table? Absolutely. Not always that cheery. Absolutely, he sets the table. What else can I do? Nine times out of ten, there's nothing else to do. But I'm trying to teach him to just keep on asking what else he can do. The message to all of us, kids or adults, is that in the words of Solomon, we need to tend to our own vineyard. We need to tend to our own backyard. We need to tend to our home and our family and our property. We need to tend to us. Are we being slothful at home? Are we being a sluggard? Or are we taking care of what needs to be taken care of? Follow along with me in this next illustration that we find in Proverbs chapter 24. We read in verse 30, I walk by the field of a lazy person, the vineyard of one with no common sense. I saw that it was overgrown with nettles, it was covered with weeds, and its walls were broken down. And then as I looked and thought about it, I learned this lesson. A little extra sleep, a little more slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest. Then poverty will pounce on you like a bandit. Scarcity will attack you like an armed robber. Nature, when not cared for, will produce weans and thorns and just randomness. There will really, really be no purpose to it. And soil, when left alone, will produce unknowns. When we are purposeful with our soil, when we follow instructions on the seed packets, when we care for our soil, when we add water and add nutrients, fruit comes forward. It's the same thing with our family soil. When we leave it alone, when we don't care for it, when we don't watch it, when we, when we don't tend to it, who knows what will grow up. But if we take care of our soil at home, fruit will come forward. What causes us to start to neglect our own backyard? It's a socially acceptable disease called workaholic. We go to work all day, we deliver, we meet goals, and then we come home, we're too tired, we're too exhausted, we're too spent. We're too distracted, and that then forces us, or causes us, or we decide to put off the till tomorrow attitude when we come home. The workaholic fails to assume the responsibility as a parent or even as a child. They fail to assume the responsibility as a member of the family because they're too heavily involved with their work. Eventually, we need to recognize that we are spending too much time and energy at our work because possibly, maybe, it's easier than struggling with our responsibilities at home. 
So here's the bottom line. Are you a Christian? Have you confessed your faith in Jesus? In doing so, have you committed to following Jesus, his, his example, and everything that he says, doing your best to live as he did, sharing him with others? Jesus' character was the furthest thing from being a sluggard. And so if you are feeling convicted, we must repent. We must change. That leads to freedom. We've talked about being a sluggard at work. We've talked about being a sluggard at home. Let's bring it very personally for a moment. The most common and the most dangerous place to be a sluggard is in our spiritual life. The failure to regularly engage in our spiritual exercises is often because of sloth. Are you doing your devotions, personal or as a family? Growing up in our household, devotions were every morning before school, and if we didn't get them done, we were late for school. I'm telling you, we grew up in a strict house. <laughs> but the lesson taught was that we're going to do this together. We're going to pray together. We're going to read together. Are you regularly attending the community of faith that you belong to? Are you regularly spending time in prayer? Or do the words come out of your mouth or in your brain, I don't have time for that right now, I'll do it later? Or do we make excuses, not just about time, but do we make excuses that maybe we don't have the right resources? I would, I would love to be in a small group if... I would love to read my Bible if, if I had the right reading plan. If we're making excuses, if we're saying words like tomorrow I'll do this or someday I'll do that, we may have the attitude, we may have the sin of being a sloth. Moment by moment, day by day, a little bit at a time, as we make those excuses, as we say those words, the spiritual battle is lost when we give in to the sluggard way. The sluggard plays a huge part in the book of Proverbs. Solomon emphasizes what a sluggard is over and over and over again, but then he also emphasizes wisdom and the cost to not be a sluggard over and over and over again. How do you find freedom from this seventh deadly sin? Read Proverbs and highlight every time you receive sloth or sluggard or lazy. When we fail to engage in life transformation, that's another sign that we may be a as having the sin of being a sluggard. We read the examples of the Corinthian church in 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 3. Try to be so organized and tab my Bible in preparation. Just didn't work. 1 Corinthians 3. Dear brothers and sisters, when I was with you, I couldn't talk to you as I would to spiritual people. I had to talk to you though you belong, uh, I had to talk as though you belong to this world and as Though you were in infants in Christ, I had to feed you with milk, not with solid food, because you weren't ready for anything stronger. And you still aren't ready, for you're still controlled by your sinful nature. You are jealous of one another and quarrel with each other. Doesn't that prove you're controlled by your sinful nature? Aren't you living like people of the world? That was a sluggard waker passage that Paul <laughs> gave to the Corinthians. He's saying, wake up. They lack self-discipline and diligence to deny themselves a pleasure which were ruining their testimony. It was ruining their own spiritual growth as well as, well as the well-being of their brother or sister in Christ, as well as the, the potential faith of their neighbor. Paul was telling them that they were spiritual sluggards. Like I said, he was taking a brass knob and waking them up and tapping them on the head. So, the... To wrap this all up, to, to stop being so down and depressing. I hate when I preach and I'm down and depressing. I'm trying not to be. I apologize. No, I don't. Do you have the perspective of a sluggard? Have you said those words, tomorrow I will do this or someday I will do that? I have said those words, and if no one else will admit it, I will. As I said, this was a very convicting message. Do we have the perspective? Do we have the perspective of tomorrow looks better than today? I have lots of time tomorrow. I just want to do nothing today. Do we often say or sometimes say, if it's not easy, I won't do it? Or a, a proverbial, the slide down the hill is not worth the walk back up. Went to Word of Life winter retreat this past winter, and they have a, a tubing hill, which is phenomenal. But they have to walk up the tubing hill, which isn't so phenomenal. But the slide down was well worth it. Just let me say that. 
Do we look for shortcuts or easy roads because they may look enticing? Do we, do we have the attitude that bare minimum is good enough? When we're looking at a sloth and a sluggard, we need to look at the area of our work. And when we're on the clock, are we giving it our all? We need to look at our home. Are we sacrificing in order to show love? Are we, are we leading our family to Jesus? Growing up, that was always, always a guy's job. Fathers, men, are you leading your family? Are you? And if there's not a man or a father in the picture, ladies, are you leading your children to Jesus? Around here in the church community, are you involved in the community? Are you engaged? Are you committed to ministry? Are you, are you sacrificing time? Are you going the extra mile? Are you doing everything you can for the glory of God to help this family? Are you sacrificing your comfort to help out in the tent on a Sunday morning? Are you helping out with the student ministry? By the way, students are not scary. And so if you want to help out, we need help. I'd love to have you. Soft little plug there, just so you know. They don't bite hard. Good, you got that. Are you bringing food for those that need it? Are you coming and rehearsing for worship, not just on a Thursday night, but at home? Are you giving generously? Are you involved in corporate prayer? Are you coming here on a Saturday and helping clean because we need help? Or are we taking the easy way out because someone else will do it? Or I don't have time. Are you thinking of somebody or did someone just pop in your head when I read all those things? Oh, so-and-so needs to hear this message. They're such a sloth. Maybe we need to hold up a mirror. Is what we do, the bottom line is, is what we do is who we are honoring God? Is it honoring to only put in half an effort? In everything we, we do, as we read in Colossians, we should do our best. We should strive for excellence. It's not, we're not looking for perfection. Perfection is very different and impossible. But are we striving for excellence and are we striving for excellence so that we can give a pleasing sacrifice to God as we do everything as if it's for an audience of one? This is not a factor in God's love. This is not a factor in our salvation. This is not a factor in whether God favors us or not, whether he accepts us. God's love to us and for us is not dependent on our behavior or our attitude or performance. Man's love and how we're accepted by man is dependent on how we perform, but not God's. However, our best should be a natural response to his love. Our best should be a natural response, a natural response to who he is. And so when you go home this afternoon, are you giving God your best through your actions and words and attitudes? I will after I nap. <laughs> I was kidding. When you go to work tomorrow morning, are you giving God your best through your actions and your words, through the projects you complete, through your interactions with your workmates? Kids, when your parents are telling you to do something for the millionth time, because they will and we do, are you listening and are you doing with a thought and the attitude of giving God your best. In our faith life, are we giving God our best? Or are we making excuses? We have a choice to make. And we can continue to be bonded or held down and bonded and chained up by these seven deadly sins, by this sin, if we continue to make excuses, or we can make the choice to step up. Hard work doesn't bring God's favor. It's God's favor that brings a proper response. I want to invite the worship team up at this time. As they get settled, we'll pray. Guys, this was 
I'm telling you, this was a tough message for me to share. If you haven't learned anything about me yet, it's when I feel a little bit uncomfortable and nervous, clearly I put my hands in my pocket. <laughs> and I try and add some humor bit just to lighten the pressure a little bit. But know 100% that this message and the words spoken are spoken in love. And if no one else listened, I listened. Because it was convicting. And so if you felt convicted, be encouraged. You're not alone. There's someone else with you that struggles with this. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for your word. Thank you that we find freedom in your word and through your word. God, my prayer this morning that as we listen and as we uh, digest what has been spoken and shared, that we will strive to do everything to the best of our abilities, not so that we get the glory, not so that we get the fame, not that we get the recognition, but God, may we do everything that's been given to us, that's been asked, as, asked of us, that's been assigned to us. May we do everything for your glory for your honor. May we do it as an act of worship. May we do it as an act of thanks. May our love and commitment and devotion to you be reflected in what we do. Praise all in Jesus' name. Amen.